and some of those are some of the things that um, are the outcomes and um, the benefactors, let's say, of how we are looking at readapting some of those things. And in the same sense, obviously socially distant, but we were cohorting. We had to look at how can we reduce distances for the staff and the doctors and um, make sure that their facilities were all aimable because they were under a lot of pressure. And that was one of the key things that we heard a lot. The, of course, I think most everybody around the world saw the arrows on the ground. You know, the biggest outcome is how do you create a unidirectional flow of things? And that means how do you bring in, you know, you, you ensure like you don't backtrack and you create that level of um, safety. So you can, a staff member, a, the nurse, the doctor can come, they can put um, their PPE, they can go in, and that unidirectional aspect um, was really important. But not all facilities were designed that way. This is a global cheat sheet of other amenities that you can go to the outside. Um, and these are some of the adaptions. You know, you can have parts of subwaiting, you know, dining could actually now be in the parking lot or temporary street closures. You know, the pharmacy became, obviously you drive through and you walk through, uh, walk up, but even triaging could be at the drive through. So like a lot of things that um, forced us in the last few months to rethink some of our approaches. And even meetings could happen in the garden if you had ample garden space outdoors. So it's not just a functional thing, but it's an emotional thing. One of the things I want to touch on, and I'll do it um, briefly, is that whole patient experience and how do we use that off stage. So I'm going to point. Возникла техническая проблема. Попросим. So we have a technical problem. Uh, will you, you please uh, just facilitate uh, the uh, sound recovery from the part of the technicians? Uh, there's no sound in the headsets. Uh, dear colleagues, um, uh, w we are in the midst of a uh, connection uh, reinstitution. Uh, uh, let me highlight uh, the speech of uh, the uh, f the idea of the first speech. It was a solitogenous environment. Uh, Ivan Delany uh, was uh, the father founder of uh, the Health Acad Academy, and based on the uh, phytogenesis. Uh, uh, theory and our environment uh, may lead uh, to a disease and at the same time it may improve the health of a human being. And with, due to this particular notion, we may organize such an environment which will be just a safe one and will not do anything with the detriment of a person, but it will also enhance the resilience to coronavirus and other uh, diseases. And uh, today in Moscow, we undertook the unprecedented measures uh, to safeguard people from uh, coronavirus and also improve and strengthen the health uh, of a human being. And nowadays, uh, our citizens may go uh, to the uh, store, to the hospital, to any other institution. They may be vaccinated and they may check their health. And I would like to address Alexei Kripun. Minister of the Government of Moscow, Head of Moscow Healthcare Department. Are, you, are we supposed to have the mega super equipped uh, hospitals or every park will have a team of uh, doctors, physicians to check the health of people and uh, to instruct people on their healthy lifestyle, on sports and on the um, uh, proper nutrition and uh, probably you have some expertise on that score and some innovations uh, to spell out. And uh, how to make the uh, pandemic resilience uh, more effective and efficient in uh, the Moscow City institutions. Uh, dear colleagues, um, 
how we in Moscow do construct uh, the urban area, uh, which is uh, uh, very uh, comfortable, uh, which is agile uh, for the lifestyle. And of course, uh, much is contributed uh, from the city budget uh, onto that purpose. And we are talking about the uh, immune system of the city. We know that uh, every person, every human being has uh, his immune system, and uh, the panel uh, the topic of the panel uh, session uh, embodies uh, the essence as how to organize uh, safe and secure conditions within the city and to create a specific environment uh, to heal and uh, to protect people. And it turns to be very essential. Will you please uh, show the next slide? Uh, it is uh, really topical for such cities and towns and settlements uh, uh, where quite a number of people are being concentrated with a high level of density and communication. And Moscow is uh, one of the largest uh, uh, metropolis of uh, the globe, and it's the Russian uh, first uh, um, hub and concentrating uh, offices, uh, R&D institutions, uh, residential areas, and about 13 million people have a permanent residence in Moscow. And I uh, would like to say that it's about uh, 25 plus million tourists a, uh, a year and uh, migration and immigration to Moscow, agglomeration of about uh, 3 million people altogether from various areas of Moscow uh, in, constitutes on a daily basis about 20 million people. And thereby, uh, we are in need of the approaches mentioned above. If we take into account the system of health care in Moscow, we uh, hospitalize more than 2 million people on an annual basis. And in Moscow, we have 136,000 um, babies, and uh, we have uh, more than 100 million uh, visits to, uh, to outpatient clinics. It's uh, very close uh, to the entire population of Russia. And we have some serious uh, specific features, uh, uh, and thus we are addressing uh, challenges and creating a specific environment uh, to be resilient and to be a healing one. Yes, next slide, please. Uh, it was absolutely impossible uh, to be prepared uh, for the challenges of the pandemic as of uh, last spring, and uh, it, Moscow is uh, uh, so large uh, that we couldn't uh, just prepare the city within a few months uh, for the pandemic uh, conditions. And within uh, um, uh, decades, we've been improving the infrastructure, uh, having the strategic goal to create uh, a very condensed, a compact, uh, and very efficient, uh, ecologically uh, sound system. And uh, the number of uh, legal entities uh, among medical uh, institutions uh, uh, have sh has shrunk uh, threefold in Moscow. And we, to a large extent, uh, contracted the number of uh, uh, hospitals uh, which were placed uh, in some specific facilities. And at random, these facilities uh, were selected, and they couldn't implement uh, the above-mentioned strategy. And by 2.5 times, uh, the number of uh, hospitals uh, has uh, shrunk in Moscow, but they have become smart, uh, fully equipped uh, with the medical equipment and technologies, having a high throughput capacity uh, and uh, using this uh, smart technologies, and uh, they made a serious breakthrough. So by the start of the pandemic, and uh, I will cite some figures for Moscow, we have seen uh, 28 beds in hospitals per 100,000 of population, and there is a reserve of uh, artificial ventilation units, 35 units per 100,000 of population. So those are important and indicative figures that allow us, without any obstacles, to support the patients in the heavy conditions that have suffered from the COVID infection. So last year we have easily placed 26,000 uh, beds in the 66 medical uh, institutions. So the saturation of uh, reanimation beds and the artificial ventilation, the saturation is higher than the average for Europe. 
26,000 beds we were able to deploy only uh, because the system was flexible. So you can uh, also reprofile the somatic beds or you can uh, open the possibility for the remaining beds to accept a higher flow of uh, patients. So you, s you can see here on the slide some figures that the system is op operating uh, with high efficiency and the volume of medical services rendered is great. Next slide, please. We have received at the same time a new uh, impetus for a serious development of infectious support for population, and that includes establishing new infrastructure. Uh, look, last year we've started building uh, infectious disease number one, hospital number one, which is 100,000 square meters, 600 more beds, which on the one hand meet all the requirements for insulating a boxed uh, uh, placement of patients, Nelson type, and on the other hand, that allows for accepting and accommodating very serious advanced equipment, and that includes visualization techniques for diagnostics and lab uh, techniques, and that includes also modern invasive uh, curing techniques. And the main thing that is available there is specific insulation, a possibility to provide for airtight organization of space with a simultaneous application of uh, advanced air purification systems that includes a high degree of purification and filters. And a similar principle was applied when a smaller hospital was introduced some two years ago for children, an infectious hospital in the Komunarka region of Moscow. And other institutions are being built and commissioned. It was an, an intermittent flow of introducing, commissioning a new uh, establishments. And my apologies for uh, you know doing that in a hurry because the first uh, report uh, was a little bit higher. So commissioning and repairing the available infrastructure in Moscow. An ideal illustration for today's topic is. This project called Moscow Polyclinic Standard, which is major overall with rebuild and upgrading. So what we are keeping is only the structural basis of the building, and they they are further saturated with new equipment, new technologies, new healthcare, and they are meeting the, the compliant to the new principles of space, illumination, uh, routing, new ideology, new mood both for the staffers and for the patients. Next one. So eventually 137 hospitals will be fully renovated by the end of the year 23 and 160 more and 44 more to, to get to a greater figure. So in principle the design that we are discussing today, number one here, the Moscow healthcare system today is to a great degree digitized already, and that allows to set up this high standard. New standards have been introduced with accommodating new incoming patients with the principle of doctor going to the patient, not the vice versa. That changes the routing of human flow within the institution. That contributes to better organization of uh, space technologies and the respective mood of the interacting people. Upgrading the equipment, what we do in preparing these spaces for accepting and accommodating new equipment should be full operational tomorrow, day after tomorrow, and a few years to come. So this flexibility should be in the project from the very start. Power efficiency to, make, to, uh, to keep the heat, new materials, new surfaces, new communication principles introduced, and of course sanitation and epidemiological protection of the medical sites that I have already mentioned. Next one. The Komunarka Hospital is not only a, an infectious disease hospital, not only polyclinics that we are upgrading. There is an ongoing construction of one of the Europe's largest uh, institutions in Europe in the same Komunarka location with a great number of beds available. It's a multi-profile institution. Comunarca today is only accepting 
COVID patients. But as the epidemic will fade away, this will become a multi-profile clinic that is already fully commissioned and fully compliant to the principles that we are announcing today. Both space, technological side, pu purity of air communications, etc. So in 40 days, we have managed to build a countryside hospital in Voronovo. It was initially perceived as a temporary hospital, but now it's a, it's a little township fully equipped, again, fully compliant. So today, this is a full-scale hospital aiming to the future. We hope it will work for many years to come. The Loganov Medical Center that is being built, it's another unique institution, 600 beds, fully compliant. As I said before, just an illustration of the fact that the principles of both design and construction and overall approach, they are being successfully implemented in Moscow today. Well, that was a very good idea that we have to communicate. The Moscow government is not just pursuing great number of beds, because we have a paradoxical situation. More hospitals you have, more beds you have, then more patients you see. So the Moscow government is now reducing the threshold so that there are fewer cars traveling around. So you're not only building more hospitals with more beds, but you're changing the atmosphere of different emotions. Because previously, you know, well, the hospital was associated with pain, it was something very sad and inevitable, something fatal. So you're redesigning those institutions these days. So with higher technologies, better technologies, give us hope that the Moscovites uh, will be getting better faster and sooner. So whatever I said uh, is an illustration that Moscow is following the most advanced sophisticated trends in designing, building, and uh, promoting the healthcare system. Yeah, we can see that. And thank you for sharing this knowledge. And I hope the participants will get the handouts and can get more uh, consult con consultations in your department. And now uh, we will switch over to the next speech. I would like to invite John Cooper, who has been establishing medical institutions for the last 35 years. So, John, can, uh, can you hear us? Have you joined us? John, do you hear us? Yes. Well, John, please tell us, the life cycle of a building is something between 30 to 50 years if it's well built. But medical equipment and technologies are changing much faster. Let's say in five years, a computer tomograph will be maybe much smaller, pocket size. So how should the infrastructure change to follow this progress of the medical institution? How should they change to follow the advances in technology? What is your opinion, please? Uh, right. Good morning, everyone, from a sunny London. Um, in a secular economy, we can no longer afford to design disposable hospitals. And a hospital's life has to be longer than 30 or 40 years. And the way to do this is that we've been talking about long life loose fit for the better part of 50 years, but it's not often um, economy and finance gets in the way. So what we need to do is to create a plug in plug out form of design in which the building has a chassis, which is the public realm, if you like, where people come in, visitors come in, ambulatory patients circulate. It also contains the private segregated circulation of inpatients and FM. And it has to be separate from the clinical wings and clinical functions so that these are effectively, um, it's the new pavilion hospital. And I'd like to bring this back to Florence Nightingale in a way in that um, everything that Mohammed was talking about, I was going to talk about, so that's good, that we've got a shared view. If you take daylight as an absolute arbiter, as a rule, if, what we've got to get away from is the deep plan plinth, what we call the muffin with the matchbox on top. That's, I think, no longer a satisfactory diagram for designing hospitals. There is no need for any clinical function to be on a floor plate that's deeper than 
23 square meters, with the exception of um, radiotherapy Linac chambers that are kind of extra structural anyway. So that yeah. <clears throat> what we've got to do is to create adaptable floor plates that can accommodate theatres, outpatients, whatever you care to put in them, that have sufficient resilience with regard to their mechanical and electrical structures, um, ceiling plenums, and main risers, that you can come in and change them at 10, 15 year periods. Um, Equipment is getting smaller, there's no doubt about that, but the ergonomics of taking a patient, let us say, off a trolley into an MRI or a CT remain the same. I mean, there are certainly ways in which imaging equipment is getting smaller, but theatres are getting bigger, so that you have to anticipate what the future may bring. Um, we know that the digital revolution is as important as our response to climate extinction, is as important as our response to uh, COVID, coronavirus. Um, we know that we can now increasingly manage chronic diseases um, in the home and that there is a migration of services that have traditionally been provided in a hospital to community or primary settings. But we've got to begin to realize that climate, the climate crisis is as important as the coronavirus crisis. And that we have to have net zero hospitals or hospitals that are absolutely minimal in their use of carbon. And that too leads us to adaptable floor plate solutions which in turn are in, enable far greater daylight penetration into buildings so that they become better places in which the staff work, which one of the things which um, COVID has done is demonstrated what poor working conditions a lot of our hospitals provide our staff. And it's increasingly important that they have access to daylight for their circadian rhythms and a whole heap of other things and that we begin to completely relook at the way in which we think about hospitals. And when you start getting into that mindset, so too they become increasingly recognisable in a city as civic public buildings, which have civic public functions. And I think that that's a very important part, because certainly in countries such as the UK, um, we're seeing what we call the death of the high street, but, but cities are changing significantly as people shop online. So that many of the landmarks in our cities are disappearing in a sense, and others are taking their place. And the hospital is a place for um, repairing and also educating health as a place of, um, of learning, uh, university learning, as a place of research tied into life science research. I mean, in the middle of London, there's the largest um, life sciences um, building now, I think, in Europe, which is the Cripps building. I mean, it's proudly right in the middle of the city. So what we're beginning to do is to see the changing phase of our cities in which healthcare allied to learning, allied to life science research and other forms of research is becoming an increasingly important component, both in terms of city life, in terms of employment in the hospitals. A large hospital has a daytime population of about 5,000 people which is equivalent to a small town or village. Um, and also, as a consequence, they're economic generators uh, in terms of that employment and also um, what they bring to a city. So 
That's a very long-winded answer to the question which you asked me. Yeah. Hello? John, thank you for your insights, uh, because really we're uh, turning to new, new reality. И я перейду на русский язык. Сегодня действительно... And I'm switching to Russian now. Yes, today the technologies enable us to provide some uh, testing uh, at home so we can reduce the number of lamps in hospitals, to reduce the structure, infrastructure in hospitals and uh, clinics. So instead of that space that we will free, uh, we can accommodate new infrastructure uh, new equipment that will be yes uh, education for health because if we are talking of overall uh, urban or city immunity it is specifically the uh, healthcare institutions are to become the centers for education life sciences not only to repair his or her body but also to behave in a different way so that this equipment human equipment never fails again so you can get inoculated or vaccinated against many other diseases. So let me thank John again for his insights. And now we are going to switch over to the next speaker. And this is Timur Handerbaev, who heads the most innovational medical cluster of today in Russia. And we know that this center will bring together the most advanced technologies. We also know that the building was actually constructed uh, in the system of uh, salutogenic design where actually walls are curing the patients. So please, please tell us what are the principles and technologies that you use? Oh, yes, thank you. I'm responsible for the designing of the international medical cluster, responsible for designing and construction. And let me thank the organizers of this great event in these uh, complex times. Um, our international medical cluster as regards the design and construction in fact, we are located within the Skolkova institution and where the purpose is transfer foreign technologies in medicine, science, education, manufacturing in healthcare areas so that our doctors could share their experience uh, with a foreign uh, institution so that we can share all those innovations uh, within the Skolkova platform. Uh, we're dating back to 2015 and currently we have about uh, 858 square meters of prospective construction, and we're actively uh, developing the D1 area, which is our main medical uh, institution. About 240 square meters are being built right now, and we have uh, commissioned the first diagnostic body of the uh, very old Israeli clinic, Hadassah, and we are going to uh, commission the second uh, general cure uh, building of the same hospital, and that includes many areas, including oncology. We're also in actively design, construction design. There's a French revolutionary center, as well as a university a cluster of Strasbourg, a technology lab, a unique uh, institution, multi-function uh, institutional center. I will tell you it. And there's also a nuclear uh, medical center and some infrastructure objects. So this is a medical township that we see. In fact, it is. And it's not just a number of uh, uh, buildings on one system. This whole uh, ecosystem and uh, an important factor and uh, factor here is patient-centered approach. So a patient is the head of this structure. So the whole territory, ever since we started the patient should be well protected, should be fully escorted from the time he entered and is accepted. So there are some park and drive facilities and the parking areas have been divided so that we have separate routing for public and private vehicles and we have separate service and support flows so that patients will never intersect with some technology and support uh, routing like garbage collection. Our patients also have a special facility for parking route. So within Skolkova Township, we will a territory, our campus is big, and we do not only have separate clinics, but this is a whole big park 
that is interwoven with different medical institutions. So that way, uh, great attention is paid to well-being of the campus, separate gardening facilities, and some sus suspended gardens, so that you can either feel alone there, relax, communicate with the family, or it may be a, 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 an opposite way, a socialization factor. So we'll be the whole central square soon, and we can have, have showrooms, master classes, etc. And also fairies and skating rings may be installed there. And on the whole, we have quite a number uh, of uh, points uh, which uh, have uh, um, which are of great attention and uh, uh, which are really very much liked uh, by our citizens and also pretty uh, often visited by the foreigners. The architecture of the building is another prime focus of ours and it's a unique one and it is based on the concept of the foreign-based architects who have been dealing with the construction and design of quite a number of outpatient clinics. And whenever we uh, create architecture, design, logistics, uh, protocols, flows uh, um, for the foreign clinics and uh, outpatient clinics, we may attract uh, uh, the technologies and get them transferred. And uh, uh, any physician may come here as a guest and feel himself as if uh, he's at home. And the key factor is the adaptiveness. And um, one of the most uh, uh, thrilling facilities is the medical mall, the um, International Multifunctional Medical Center. And on the roof, uh, under its roof, they may have quite a number of uh, specific uh, outpatient clinics for gematology, uh, uh, hematology, for oncology, and uh, um, uh, other wards, and even the uh, uh, child care ward. And they are all interconnected uh, by one hallway and uh, promenade. Uh, they may be uh, put together and disintegrated, and it is um, very aptly uh, for every uh, outpatient clinic like that. Uh, and uh, the territory of Skolkovo, we have uh, this uh, facility, and um, uh, people may be trained uh, further and uh, provide renovation of their outpatient clinics and hospitals. Uh, yes, your center uses uh, not just uh, the medical equipment, spare technologies, molecular and uh, also um, uh, brain cells, but they actually create a comfortable environment uh, for the physicians uh, for communication with the relatives of their patients. And uh, it is uh, really uh, uh, a very interesting area. It's uh, like Zariadi Park. It's not at all a hospital. And it has a very attractive landscape uh, architecture with a great uh, design. Uh, and it is intertwined uh, with the concept of Alexei Ivanovich as people are now uh, keen uh uh, on the high energy efficiency and uh, minimizing the um, environmental footprint. And uh, we may construct something with the detriment of the environment, but already uh, we've been relying on the energy efficiency, agility and flexibility, uh, adaptivity, and uh, being centered on the patient and uh, those who are around him. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And the next speaker is our colleagues. Uh, Thomas, uh, you uh, should be here uh, with us. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, Thomas uh, Willemate, uh, and uh, we may come to various uh, uh, words and there should be some uh, tests uh, taken uh, like uh, cardiovascular tests and measurements uh, and uh, if we come to the uh, cockpit of a pilot uh, we may see quite a number of panels and technologies and he's managed he managed uh, uh, to combine all these two facilities and uh, the information about the patient is always visible also the ambient temperature uh, the daylight uh, climate uh, control, acoustic uh, comfort, uh, and all these parameters uh, may uh, promote uh, the uh, 
better health of a patient. And uh, Thomas, uh, could you please uh, specify how you managed uh, to combine science, uh, culture, music, and the environment? Thomas, uh, the floor is yours. To speak for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I hope it fits very well on the panel. Um, as uh, <clears throat> I have not had a, a translation of your introductory speech, and my Russian is not that perfect. Uh, so I am uh, trying to talk to you. I would like to talk I'll to you about I'll just few intro few words will tell you that I was speaking that uh, we are used that patient has information doctor has information about patient his EG, ECG, everything. Pilot of the plane has information about data about the plane. But you joined these ideas, information exactly. about environment of the patient and his personal data to make it better for, for the healing of a patient. Could you explain this idea? How did you realize it? Can you see my screen? Then I will do ICU rooms, intensive care units. Uh, but it's, uh, in, uh, as far as I see, a pretty unique uh, project that not only tries to understand the effect of architectural parameters to the process of healing, but also since we finished these rooms, uh, about six years ago, we tried to collect the evidence to be able to really prove how exactly certain aspects in architecture can guarantee a better outcome of the patients. Uh, since, we, since we are comparing the outcome of the patients in these rooms uh, that we are able to, were able to build at the Char Charité, Berlin's biggest hospital, uh, with uh, conventional ICU rooms that uh, normally um, look like this. Uh, this so-called parametric dream room design project examines how the design of intensive care units can be modified to benefit the process of recovery. Uh, the research project ad addressed stress-inducing factors such as room acoustics by reducing, for example, noise and alarm signals uh, temperature regulation and visual aspects, such as the materials, light, color, and media surfaces used. So we all know uh, already that the lack of sleep, uh, interrupted sleep, for, uh, for example, uh, the feeling of disorientation after, after an uh, orientation when you wake up uh, coming out of a sed sedation, uh, uh, certain different aspects that cause stress and the feeling of helpless, helplessness uh, really um, uh, affect the process of, of uh, healing negatively. And we were trying to, even before we uh, started to design the rooms, to understand these paramet uh, parameters exactly uh, by speaking to staff members, caretakers, doctors, uh, everybody working on ICUs. Uh, and uh, first of all, try to implement a new layout for these two ICU rooms that you uh, probably see now right in front of you. That uh, red uh, uh, little square in the middle shows, indicates an uh, op so-called observation room that we introduced in the middle in between these two ICU rooms. Uh, why? Because uh, we understood that, um, that uh, most of the traffic in the ICU rooms. All the alarm signals, the noises in the ICUs uh, are really causing a lot of stress and we wanted to allow doctors to observe the patients, especially at night, from that separate room that's completely acoustically separated from the, from the two rooms with uh, two beds for patients. We managed to also convince the manufacturers of the, uh, of the uh, equipment in ICUs to modify the equipment uh, as such that we had been uh, putting all the alarm signals out of the patient rooms into that observation chamber that shows all the vital data also on separate screens uh, with the effect that, for example, at night nobody has to enter the ICU rooms interrupting sleep of the patients, uh, but also at night uh, during, during the day, uh, you could come into these ICU rooms and see uh, and hear they are completely silent and allow people to sleep at any time of the day. 
Uh, but even more important, we were, of course, interested in re-establishing day and night rhythms by, uh, uh, by uh, allowing some traffic and, and uh, busy active uh, atmosphere happen during the day and a complete uh, noise-free, silent atmosphere at night. And we were actually, at the end of the day, uh, um, uh, able to prove that this works. But uh, even more than these uh, measurable uh, factors, we were very much uh, interested in the beginning of the design to, uh, to start uh, in the design of the room with uh, um, uh, examples that are um, positively connoted uh, with like every one of us. Uh, like what, what are really positive uh, memories that you have uh, uh, when you think of sleeping or laying in bed and when you look at all these examples of cabanas, of cocooning in, in furniture design, then uh, we, we uh, uh, understand that lying in bed is not necessarily a negative aspect. So when we started to design the rooms, we tried to understand exactly the perception of the patient. Uh, trying to analyze and diagram what exactly the, the, the patients are looking at. And that is uh, some so far completely neg neglected area, of course, that's mostly the ceiling in the ICU room. So we understood exactly the, the angles of the sight of the, the patients. We, are trying, we were trying to understand where, what area we needed to address. And that's mostly, of course, the area above the patient. And uh, understanding that missing daylight is uh, probably uh, one of the most important factors in, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, irritations in melatonin, melatonin uh, uh, production in the human body, um, we try to uh, bring in a, a huge, large uh, um, uh, light, um, uh, uh, light uh, um, fixture in the room, which is a two by two meter screen area that uh, feeds, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, artificial, but uh, daylight-like uh, uh, lighting scenario to the eye uh, of the, the patient. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, light fixture illuminates in a circadian rhythm. That means that uh, around 11 o'clock in the morning that, uh, that artificial sun seems to be rising, it illuminates and, and uh, uh, the intensity of the line is, is, uh, is getting bigger and bigger. And it also uh, tries to simulate how the sun uh, uh, would be going down and, 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 and uh, uh, the, the day daylight would be reduced during the day, only because we understood that this additional um, amount of uh, artificial daylight would have an effect of the melatonin uh, production, uh, keeping the, the patient more awake during the, uh, during the day uh, to, to make him or her able to sleep better at night. Uh, but not only that was uh, uh, the reason for that huge two by seven meter 50 large screen above, above the patient. We also uh, introduced a second a grid of LED lights above the patient that is uh, able to show moving images. And uh, this is not only to, uh, to allow uh, a blue sky um, to, to, yeah. to appear above the patient and moving clouds to calm down patients, which in, uh, uh, in its, uh, their speed would react to, uh, 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 to how awake a patient is, how to the basically to the vital data that is uh, collected during the day, uh, but also we try to allow the patients to um, interactively play with this uh, screen, so they could modify what what kind of injury they would like to see, and also doctors use that screen above the patients uh, to understand in uh, with uh, like some media interfaces how well the brain in uh, connection with, uh, uh, in relation to motoric functions of the body would re, uh, that connection would be reestablished after phases of sedation. Um, so that screen Thomas, is basically Thomas, Thomas. a multidisciplinary um, aspect that allows us to really understand 
uh, how the visual uh, aspect of the environment would affect the healing process of the patients. You see Thomas, that, can uh, you hear me? Thomas? Yes. yes. It's a brilliant idea to give a patient uh, to play with his surrounding. We have 30 seconds left for your presentation, and I want to ask a very brief question. Do patients have access to music, high-quality stereo, and what kind of music you would suggest for patients to boost the healing? Yes, of course, patients have access to music. Actually, their personal uh, playlist can be fed into the acoustic system of the healing environment, as we understood that the personal uh, environment, that the individual environment that reminds patients of their home is actually very beneficial for the, uh, for the patients. Thank you, Thomas. We run out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, uh, we've just followed uh, the attitude and approach of the uh, leading uh, colleagues of ours, uh, but uh, infectionists uh, cannot uh, settle the problem of health care as well as uh, therapists and other doctors. But we're supposed to have interdisciplinary approach and architects, architects should be a part of this process as they do design our um, settlements, urban area uh, to make uh, our uh, citizens healthy. And uh, we've followed presentations uh, from various uh, um, business areas, and uh, the architects uh, ma mentioned that we have to create the environment stimulating the healing uh, of a human being and uh, being socialized. Uh, in, and the specific atmosphere should be created in a specific uh, hospital. And uh, Thomas, in his last presentation, uh, Thomas Willemere mentioned that uh, such simple things like a blue sky and acoustic comfort tend to be indispensable. And uh, we try uh, to create this atmosphere um, coupled uh, with uh, the medical treatment uh, and uh, uh, just uh, pu pu putting uh, droplets uh, in a safe way. We should give uh, the uh, silence and darkness uh, in the ICU see you uh, or give an appropriate daylight, uh, and it could heal a patient even better than any medication. And we have the technologies of uh, biodynamic uh, lighting where the solar light uh, is impossible. And we may give uh, the um, uh, blue, blue, bluish light, artificial light, comfort light, and uh, actually it should be coupled uh, with the technologies of treatment medication plus atmosphere, and thus we may uh, just pr contribute uh, to um, remedial effect of a patient. And the government of Moscow, by the way, is a proponent of this methodology, and we have to apply best practices uh, for the follow-up or implementation of them uh, at, in the city of Moscow, as Mr. Sabanian mentioned. And the healthcare system and is being changed very rapidly, and I wish you uh, all the best, the success, the creativity, so that to make our environment healthy, solid, and robust. And so thank you very much for your kind attention, uh, dear audience, and for your attention to uh, this particular topic. And uh, see you soon. Goodbye. Yes. <laughs>
in Berlin, uh, give, me, give me a ring. Absolutely. Uh, Likewise, if you're in New York, please. Uh, no, it's very nice meeting you. I have no idea. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. So, uh, I am honest, Victoria. Bye bye. Nice meeting you. Likewise, nice meeting you, Thomas. Yeah, it's not on the red thing. Let me switch the background.